to The Bible in a Year with Manna. I'm your host, Uriah Beagle, and with me today is Mr. Richard Young. Join us as we experience God's Word together and grow in our relationship with Him. Today, we'll be reading the Berean Standard Bible. The reading plan we're following is the one-year chronological Bible. Today is day number 32, and we'll be reading Exodus chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, with 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 mixed in there. Let's dive in. Exodus chapter 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, the descendants of Jacob, number 70 in all, including Joseph, who was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers in all that generation died, but the Israelites were fruitful and increased rapidly. They multiplied and became exceedingly numerous so that the land was filled with them. Then a new king who did not know Joseph came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become too numerous and too powerful for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase even more, and if a war breaks out, they may join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So the Egyptians appointed taskmasters over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. As a result, they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and flourished, so the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites." They worked the Israelites ruthlessly and made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in these fields. Every service they imposed was harsh. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, When you help the Hebrew women give birth, observe them on the birth stools. If the child is a son, kill him, but if it is a daughter, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had instructed. They let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before a midwife arrives. So God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son born to the Hebrews must be thrown into the Nile, but every daughter you may allow to live. Exodus chapter 2 Now a man of the house of Levi married a daughter of Levi, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a papyrus basket, coated it with tar and pitch, And then she placed the child in the basket and set it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. And his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Soon the daughter of Pharaoh went down to bathe in the Nile, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. And when she saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maidservant to retrieve it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the little boy was crying So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call one of the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Go ahead, said Pharaoh's daughter. And the girl went and called the boy's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse him for me, and I will pay you your wages. So the woman took the boy and nursed him. When the child had grown older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses and explained, I drew him out of the water. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to his own people and observed their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. After looking this way and that and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. The next day, Moses went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked one in the wrong, Why are you attacking your companion? But the man replied, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you planning to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, This thing that I have done has surely become known. When Pharaoh heard about the matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh 
and settled in the land of Midian, where he sat down beside a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. And when some shepherds came along and drove them away, Moses rose up to help them and watered their flock. When the daughters returned to their father, Reo, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? Well, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds, they said. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. So where is he? their father asked. Why did you leave the man behind? Invite him to come and have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man, and he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. And she gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned and cried out under their burden of slavery, and their cry for deliverance and their cry for deliverance from bondage ascended to God. So God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the Israelites and took notice. The sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, Merari. The sons of Kohath, Aram, Izar, Hebron, and Uziel. The children of Amram, Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. The sons of Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Exodus chapter 3. Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from within a bush. Moses saw the bush ablaze with fire, but it was not consumed. So Moses thought, I must go over and see this marvelous sight. Why is this bush not burning up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the affliction of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their oppressors, and I am aware of their sufferings. I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen how severely the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses asked God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I will surely be with you, God said, and this will be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, all of you will worship God on this mountain. Then Moses asked God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? What should I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also told Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is how I am to be remembered in every generation. Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me and said, I have surely attended to you and have seen what has been been done to you in Egypt, and I have promised to bring you up out of your affliction in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to what you say, and you must go with them to the king of Egypt and tell him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Now please, let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness so that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. 
But I know that the king of Egypt will not allow you to go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders I will perform among them. And after that, he will release you. And I will grant this people such favor in the sight of the Egyptians that when you leave, you will not go away empty-handed. Every woman shall ask her neighbor and any woman staying in her house for silver and gold jewelry and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters, so you will plunder the Egyptians. Exodus chapter 4. Then Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to my voice? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. And the Lord answered him, What is in your hand? A staff, he replied. Throw it on the ground, said the Lord. So Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Stretch out your hand and grab it by the tail, the Lord said to Moses, who reached out his hand and caught the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Furthermore, said the Lord to Moses, Put your hand inside your cloak. So he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, his hand was leprous, white as snow. Put your hand back inside your cloak, said the Lord. So Moses put his hand back inside the cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored, just like the rest of his skin. And the Lord said, If they refuse to believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, they may believe that of the second. But if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, take some water from the Nile and pour it out on the dry ground. Then the water that you take from the Nile will become blood on the ground. Please, Lord, said Moses, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who gave man his mouth, or who makes the mute, or the deaf, the sighted, or the blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you as you speak, and I will teach you what to say. But Moses replied, Please, Lord, send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And he is now on his way to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth. I will help both of you to speak. I will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you. He will be your spokesman, and it will be as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform signs with it. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the signs and wonders that you worked for your people. Thank you that we are still able to see you moving in our lives and in the world today. Thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you for your scripture. Please, Lord, help reveal your word and your plan to us and your wisdom to us in these readings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here we have the prophecy that was given to Abraham being fulfilled and the Israelites being slaves for 400 years here in Egypt. The Pharaoh that liked them, he's gone. New Pharaoh does not like them and just keeps making things worse and worse for the Israelites. Mm. Yeah, he he says, uh, these Israelites, they become too numerous and too powerful for us. Let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase even more. And he's got a solution. He's going to kill the children. He's kill the male children. Oh. Kill the male children. Then they can still intermarry or bring women into the harem, but there are no born Israelites at that point because they would be almost property to the Egyptians as they're bought concubines. Exactly. And, and so the net effect, though, is what the enemy means for evil God turns around and uses it for good. We see the Israelites not only prosper, they become more numerous. Yeah, there were some midwives that intervened, and then Mm -hmm. God was interceding with them. Bless them, bless the Israelites even more. We move on to his next command, which was he'll kill them when they're after they're born. And that's how we get Moses being 
taken down to the river. The Nile's a really big river for those who don't mm. know. So you're probably looking at, well, here in Virginia, we have a big river called the James River. It's pretty big in some places. Mm -hmm. The Nile's very wide. Think something like that, where you've got very broad banks. So this is not some stream he's being set into. This is a crocodile-infested river, and that's his best chance at living, is that he floats down in a basket. And his sister is, is with him, standing at a distance to see what could happen, and it's fascinating to me, Pharaoh's daughter goes down to bathe in the Nile, finds the baby, and then Moses' sister, she's not named, but Miriam is who I think it is, comes up and says, hey, would you like me to find a nurse for this little baby? And she says, sure, and Moses' mother gets paid to nurse her own son. I wonder how many of our sisters would love to have had that opportunity to get, <laughs> to get paid to nurse the baby that you've given birth to. So I, I, I just think that's a, an interesting little twist. There's a lot of things that God made go right for that all to happen. Mm. He could have just floated all the way down to the Mediterranean or up to the Mediterranean. Exactly. And it's interesting, too, okay, just the, the cultures in which Moses grows up. And mm. I think this is fascinating. He, he has, from the time he is an infant until he learns to talk, probably— the language of the Hebrews. So he knows who he is, even when he is then given back to Pharaoh's daughter to become an Egyptian. And he spends time learning the Egyptian culture. And then what strikes me there is that as the story progresses, he doesn't really earn a lot of credit with the Egyptians for, for this process. Even as he's growing in the household and then he has some troubles, Right, He goes to intervene in a fight, kills a man. And it's interesting, too. Why does he do that? Because he knows his culture. These are Hebrews being oppressed and abused by the Egyptians. And Moses knows, I'm the Savior of Israel. He's got that mission in his head and his heart. And so he steps in, kills the Egyptian, and covers it up, buries him in the sand. Yeah, but Pharaoh finds out. Ah, because some Hebrews found out. It's fascinating. You know, he's betrayed essentially by his own people. Word does get back to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's, you know, he's a judge too, right? So strange that somebody would be betrayed by their own people and mm. be almost put to death. Mm. Exactly. So, so Moses takes the law into his, his own hands, as it were. Yeah. And it's found out, takes off, and he goes to yet another culture. And he lives among the Midianites. Yeah, the children of Midian. He does as most people seem to do in this time when they run away to somebody that doesn't know them very well, and he intervenes at a well, rescues some sheep, mm -hmm. and ends up getting hitched. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting progression. I, I, I love the fact that so often when God's servants are wiped out, depressed, they end up by a source of water. You know, I think of Elijah mm. that we'll run into later in the narrative. He wipes out all these, these wicked priests of Baal and then runs away, right, when Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you. Here Moses runs away when Pharaoh says, I'm going to kill you in fear of his own life. And he ends up by a well. And then a whole beautiful string of events begin to happen. Moses says of himself, I'm a stranger in a strange land. And mm. that's who the Israelites were in a, living in a strange land. That's who sons and daughters of the living God will always be. We are in the world, but not of it. And then Moses has his first in-person encounter with God, the God of Abraham. I am uh, through a burning bush, a famous tale that many have heard as children, the tale of Moses walking up to the burning bush. And after he gets onto the holy ground, God tells him, take off your shoes. Mm-hmm. 
interesting that he let him get there in the first place without it. He's already on the holy ground, and then he removes him. Mm -hmm. And God introduces his title of I Am. There's a whole sermon by a man of church if you want to find out more about that title, uh, about why God calls himself I Am. But I, I am who I am, right? He is, mm. he is the self-existent one. He is every form of life that we know in this world depends on other forms of life in this world. But God says, I don't need any of that. He lives in eternity outside of space and time. He is the holy one. That's probably the fastest version of Riley's sermon that you could uh, give there. What the progression here, though, is Moses finds these out, and God says, I will uh, empower you. I will make it so that you can do this. I will give you the tools to do this. They will know that you are with me when you come. And then he starts asking him, but will they? Yeah, but but, but, but will they? Um Look at my natural ability, Lord. I, I'm, I'm a man. I'm, 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 I'm a man who's who's slow. I, I don't speak well. And <laughs> I don't speak well, and so I'm scared to go and do what you are calling me to do. So that's that's a fascinating part of the story. I also love the three signs: a snake, new skin, and water turned to blood. Wow. I wonder what symbology is in there. There's there's a lot there, obviously. Snakes obviously represent sin. Oh. Right? And and that serpent, the devil. New skin, our our old leprous, sinful skin revitalized, and we are given new life. How? By the washing of the water of the word and the blood of the lamb. Wow. So it's it's just fascinating to me, those three very clear signs and God said well well maybe they won't believe the first two but the third one that's the one that's going to convince them and the third sign for us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ as followers of his father the great I am who I am we we receive this new birth and that should be convincing to the culture that we are living in. We're strangers in a strange land, in the world, but not of it. Yeah. We appreciate you joining with us today. Thank you. We look forward to being with you tomorrow for day number 33 of the Bible in a Year with Manna.